from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. This is Outlook, a reflection of our place, our time, and our people. Welcome to Outlook. I'm Beth Voorhees. In tonight's program, a conversation about race, violence, and poverty. The role of race in the September rape and torture of a woman in Logan County has certainly fueled a lot of anger and concern. The victim is black, and all six defendants are white and represent some of the worst stereotypes of West Virginia. Some national civil rights advocates have seized on that case. In November, a group called Black Lawyers for Justice led a rally in Charleston to demand that hate crime charges be filed in the case. This week, the group returned to Charleston, and this time, the star was the Reverend Al Sharpton. I think that it was important to be here tonight because I think what has happened to Ma Megan Williams is a national disgrace. But as Sharpton addressed the crowd of about 100, he spoke as much about the previous march and who did not participate as he did about hate crimes. He condemned local politicians and black ministers for not joining with black lawyers for justice and Malik Shabazz. They did not join the march in part because of controversy that surrounds Shabazz. He's been criticized by civil rights groups like the Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Poverty Law Center for making anti-Semitic statements. Sharpton took locals to task for that decision. The best way to keep us out of town is for those in town to take care of hate crime business. And we won't have to come. But as long as you rape and kidnap and call our daughters nigger and don't handle it, then you can get used to us coming to town. For his part, Malik Shabazz told the crowd he will keep pushing for hate crime charges in this case. We can't just have marches that will be reduced to photo opportunities if we don't have a strategy, if we don't follow up, if we don't stay on the case. We say tonight like we did yesterday, what happened to Megan Williams was a hate crime. It is a hate crime. It must be charged as a hate crime. And if we're not backing down until hate crimes are charged, in this case, that's non-negotiable. As the Megan Williams case continues to gain attention, some say that leaders like Sharpton, local politicians, and the community itself are ignoring more pressing issues. Of particular concern is the recent escalation of street violence. On December 8th, Charleston was the scene of three separate but related shootings that crisscrossed the city. Doorbell was rang at the uh, residence of Mr. Smoot. Uh, he goes to the window, and when he arrives at the window, uh, the suspects open fire on him, and he was struck and killed on the scene uh, right there where he stood. Murders are certainly not unheard of in Charleston, but the nature of them and circumstances surrounding them are changing in the view of Pastor Matthew Watts. He heads an organization in Charleston that works with at-risk youth and juvenile offenders. Also joining us is Brandy Jones. She's the Director of Administration in Huntington and a former member of the Huntington City Council. Huntington is also a city that's been the scene of high-profile murders and shootings in recent years. To both of you, welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you very much. Thanks for having pastor me. Watts, as a pastor here in Charleston, you've had a tough year. This has been a tough year. Uh, uh, some of the escalation of violence uh, among young people uh, in our city, um, a number of deaths, uh, several still unsolved uh, without anyone having been arrested. Uh, the children of friends of mine uh, that I personally know are young people that I've tried to work with in the community. I think the, uh, the case in Logan County has put a lot of strain on relationships. And I think uh, the fact that there still has have not been a call for a unified effort to discuss and to uh, brainstorm about what we might be to do uh, to respond to this violence mm -hmm. uh, has been somewhat uh, a concern to me. You do work with at-risk youth since these shootings occurred earlier this month. What have you been saying to the youth you serve? What have you been telling them? What have you been trying to get to them? And what are they telling you? 
Well, the one thing we continue to, to espouse is that the key to success in the United States of America is education, uh, to get the skills that the economy respects and that it pays people to do it, and to try to stay on task in terms of education. We try to tell them in, that involvement in illegal drug activity is a dead-end street. It's going to lead to incarceration. It's going to lead to them having to pull a weapon to defend themselves or them being the victim of a violent crime. And we try to uh, continue to challenge them that they have to take personal responsibility and individual responsibility and they are responsible for their own actions and they cannot use their family situation, their socioeconomic situation, or the apathy and callous indifference of the society at large as an excuse mm -hmm. to engage in behavior that is destructive to themselves and the community. That's what we tell them every day. Mrs. Jones, the last time we spoke, we talked about the Detroit drug connection in Huntington. Yes. We talked about the murders of the four young people in Huntington. We talked about the problems that Huntington was really seeing and living with. What's happened since you and I first discussed this? We have actually, uh, we have new leadership with our Huntington Police Department with Chief Skip Holbrook, and he has really grabbed hold of the issues, um, strategized appropriately, allocated the resources that, that he has at his disposal, and has really tried to, to work through some of the problems in terms of prostitution, um, the drugs, um, as well as Detroit. Um, we're seeing an increase in heroin usage and heroin overdose um, in Huntington also. So we have new leadership and that's made um, a big difference. Unfortunately, the city has not been able to allocate the necessary financial resources to combat many of the problems, but with this new leadership, they are able to tackle uh, a as best they can. After the murder of the four young people, uh, to after a prom night date. There was real outrage in Huntington. Yes. Wouldn't you say there was outrage? Yeah. How, how did that outrage manifest itself and what did it lead to? That was the breaking point because community leaders and community residents in Fairfield in particular were just disgusted with the amount of illegal activity that was going on, you know, the open air drug markets that we were seeing on our streets. Um, and that, that was just the breaking point and also individuals were murdered that were not Fairfield residents. And mm -hmm. so that brought mm -hmm. in people who kind of viewed it as, well, it's no longer in someone else's community. Um, this may be happening in Fairfield, but our children from other aspects of the city are now being affected. So because the, the four individuals were from different parts, actually of the tri-state, they were not all Huntingtonians, right. that brought the region together to say, okay, we have a problem. And any one of our children could have been affected by this. What are we going to do? Are you seeing that kind of effort in Charleston as has been done in Huntington? Not yet. As a matter of fact, we were invited into the Huntington community. Mm -hmm. And we've actually opened uh, an office in the building mm -hmm. uh, where she is. And we've received great support from Pastor Mike Grider from Mission Tri-State and Huntington Pastors and mobilizing uh, people to support our efforts to establish in-school mentoring programs in select schools in Huntington. And our hope is that we will generate that same type of interest here. I think that it's moving that direction. I think things are getting so bad, and I think these two last murders and shootings mm -hmm. serve as a tipping point, and I think some people are realizing that this is not going to self-correct, uh, and we need to come together, and we're hopeful that in 2008 right. we will see a coalescing of a uh, group coming together. So what's not happening in Charleston? Uh, a lot of things aren't happening in Charleston. I think one thing is that we have not had clear, decisive, visionary leadership uh, to rally us together and to say we have to put aside our differences on some issues and agree that we all are in agreement that we want a safe community, and that's in all of our enlightened self-interest. That's a major thing that is not happening. Isn't that supposed to be you, the leadership? Isn't that supposed to be what you're doing? Well, that's what we do, and we do it from a community-based leadership, but there's an official leadership in this town that's elected by the people, and that official leadership has responsibility for the allocation of certain resources, law enforcement philosophy, community police, and that type of thing. You agree that official is the, the key here, the elected officials. That's true. I mean, you, you have to have the grassroots or their community-based support, but you do need the leadership. The individuals that you are, you have elected to represent you and represent the interest of your communities. You have to hold them to task, and their failure to do so, election season is coming up, so it may be time to look at new candidates, new leadership, or to really hold their feet to the fire saying this is what we are expecting and demanding of you. Now unfortunately I know in Huntington we have greater fiscal constraints than they have in Charleston. Charleston has the financial resources to do things differently or to approach it from a different perspective if what they are doing is not working. And so I would talk with those leaders, you know, hold them to task. They have a responsibility to answer to their constituents and often uh, constituents or residents do not 
request or mandate from their leadership to represent them accurately. They kind of just put them in office and let them go, but there needs to be some accountability. Mm -hmm. When the official leadership convenes a summit, then it can pull together the people who control law enforcement, the court, probation, prosecutor attorney's office, and bring us together to develop a comprehensive plan. Why not hold a rally? Why not get all the churches and the synagogues and the everybody together and hold your own rally? Put a spotlight on the, uh, on the situation. Can you do that? It, it, does that really well, do any you good? Know, you know, we hold court every Sunday morning. I, mean, I, I, I uh, have a live call-in radio show every Sunday morning, and we have meetings in the community. It does do good. The community is mobilized. The community is energized. The community is concerned, and they want to do some things. But the community doesn't control the court. It doesn't control the prosecutor's attorney's office. It doesn't control the police department. Nor does the community control how resources are allocated to the community level to address problems. And if I may chime in, I think that's critical that people understand the process. Because I know as a council person, people would say, you know, we need this house down. We need this. Why do we not have more officers? Well, they have to understand the process, that you can't just jump up in the beginning of a meeting and, and make these demands and requests. It's important that the citizenry learn the process, learn how decisions are, are, are made, to learn what factions are at work, what things are going on behind closed doors. I, I think that's critical because we can make these demands, we can have rallies, but really it's action. It's learning the process, and it's a lengthy process, and it's time-consuming, but residents really need to, to learn that because when they find out that budgets are already set for this fiscal year. Now cities or municipalities are beginning to look at what are we going to do next fiscal year. This is the time to come forward and, and make requests for reallocation of resources or for innovative ways to, to tackle some of these issues. So how do you get elected officials to care beyond having tragedies happen? Well, I, th I think that someone who can move them, and uh, this will be controversial, what I'm getting ready to say, right. but if it were black, if it were white young men been shot and killed in Charleston, West Virginia, everybody would have already moved. Last year there was a few, uh, there was a case of a couple of young people who overdosed, uh, overdosed on drugs in the western part of the county. The whole community was mobilized, the whole county, including myself, because we felt obligated to go down and support that community. And a countywide effort has been established to see what we can do to prevent, prevent this from happening again. But right now, because for the most part, it is African-American males that are both the victims and the perpetrators. And therefore, there's not enough sympathy in, in, on behalf of the leadership of the city, nor the city at large. When an African-American young man uh, in a attempted robbery shot and killed a Caucasian young man uh, coming from work, the whole community was outraged. For the first time in years, a juvenile's name was released before they were transferred to adult status. And what we're saying is we ought to be as outraged as a community, whether it's black on black, white on white, when you have the type of violence that you have right now in Charleston, the whole community should be concerned about it because it affects the quality of life for the whole city. Mm -hmm. And it affects the image of the capital city uh, for the rest of the state and the rest of the country. You knew these five young men. Yes. And these five young men knew each other. Yes. They were mad at each other, they were angry at each other, and they took it out on each other. It was kind of an isolated, well, it, it would appear almost, it was kind of an, an isolated uh, thing among people who knew each other. Here in Huntington, you had a situation where mm -hmm. it happened to white uh, young people mm -hmm. were the victims of the crime. Right. Don't know who the murderer was. Here, we do. Right. Does that have something to do with the attitude, I guess is what I'm asking. Does that have something to do with the attitude? I'd have to say in Huntington, that's why there was the regional outcry of the issue that enough is enough in terms of um, activity that was going on, unsavory activity. Had it been for African Americans, I do not think there would have been the national attention. I don't think we would probably be talking about this right now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, that is a fact, and, and I often wonder, if maybe the African-American community has gotten complacent because they think there isn't going to be a response. We've seen that in Huntington where people have not been reporting, have not been um, cooperating with the police department because for many years they felt as if there wasn't the level of responsiveness that there should have been or attentiveness from that department in, in particular communities. Mm -hmm. So 
I and mean, that's, that's another now. That's, that's has improved. That has improved under our new leadership, and we have to credit our leadership and the new approach that they're taking in terms of public relations and community relations and building coalitions and and talking with residents aside from when there's a crisis. You know, beginning well, actually being proactive in their approach to sure. neighborhoods. And, and right now, f well, not right now, but prior to this, it had been completely reactionary. Well, civic engagement engagement is extremely important mm -hmm. and people are not civically engaged when they don't believe that the government is responsive to them. I've tried, as I've tried to share, one of the reasons that some blacks are reluctant to get involved in terms of reporting crime is number one, that's the only way they can rebel. It's the only way they can show dissent against the system. But secondly, they no longer believe that law enforcement or the courts can or will protect them because they see violent people often being released in the name of the war on drugs and the government's attempt to catch the next person, they release in violent people in the community. Mm -hmm. And they know these people will indeed uh, uh, take revenge if they feel like they've been testified against. This is a very complicated thing and that's why it warrants everybody coming together and looking at really what's happening. There are a lot of contributing factors to the violence that we see. Mm -hmm. uh, and until you get all the people at the table where you can have the type of discussion that needs to be had, where you really understand that there's a nexus between the war on drugs and the way it is executed in terms of plea agreements or better yet confidential informants are putting known drug dealers, violent people back in the community and how that escalates the tension and contributes to some of the violence. And the fact that very often people with history of violence are often released back in the community and the, the community doesn't understand how that happens. So these are the type of things that needs to be discussed and to be understood from a legal standpoint, but at the same time those who control the court need to understand what the community's feelings and, and are about this. So let's move forward. Once this interview is done and it airs and you leave here, what will you do? Well, what we will do is what we continue to do. We'll continue to go to Juvenile Justice Task Force meetings every Friday morning and to try to coalesce that group to bring the issue of youth violence and violence in general to the, the city at large and continue to try to mobilize people at the community level. But one other thing that we will start doing is to try to articulate in a way that maybe more people can understand. And I think the Logan County situation helps. I think one of the great embarrassments to the Caucasian community is what happened in Logan County. And no one is talking about these alleged perpetrators of this crime. The alleged per perpetrators of this crime, they're the face of abject rural poverty left to itself and its own ignorance uh, and its own substance abuse and its own bad choices. And you see this type of actions can occur. In the inner city, we see what happened in terms of violence when abject poverty is left to itself. It behooves us to try to figure out how do we respond to these extreme cases of violence I mean, a poverty, recognizing that the violence we see, it is the manifestation of uh, a pathology that exists among people without excusing people of a responsibility for their actions. But there's still an environment that people are in that is helping to, uh, to, to cultivate uh, this type of disrespect for life, their own life, and the lives of other people. We've got to talk about this problem from all sides and all angles and all perspectives. All right. Pastor Matthew Watts of Hope Community Redevelopment Corporation and Brandy Jones, Director of Administration in Huntington, thank you very much. Thank you. Very thank interesting you. discussion. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Transcripts of this and other segments from tonight's Outlook are available. You can also watch video. Just go to our website. The address is wvpubcast.org.